everybody for coming and uh, hope you're having a nice weekend so far. My name is Sam Bowman, I'm running here to chair Let's Talk About Money. What is the future for banking, currencies and saving? I'm joined by Professor Tim Condon of uh, many institutions, but uh, most of you will know him as the chair of the Freedom Association. Uh, he also is a professor of economics and, uh, at Buckingham University and he is probably the UK's both the foremost monetarist economist. Uh, Lucy Bostick is at Grant Thornton. As a regulation expert, I will be talking about um, regulation and banking union in the European Union. Um, and Simon Rose is director of Save Our Savers. Um, the speaking order is going to be Tim, then Simon, then Lucy. We're going to ask each speaker to speak for between eight and nine minutes. Um, I'll back the table when your eighth minute is up. Um, then uh, we will open it up to the floor and hopefully have some entertaining and friendly banter between the panelists and the audience. So without further ado, Tim, eight minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have to tell you, uh, audience, uh, everybody, that um, I haven't prepared anything at all for the next eight, nine, ten minutes. So this is completely off the cuff. And um, at, at these occasions, and I wasn't sure exactly what I was supposed to say for today, so these occasions I find the most interesting bit is indeed the Q&A. And there are a number of topics that come up time and time again. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to try and or perhaps PM, preempt them, perhaps provoke questions. Um, and um, the first question is that uh, is about um, should we go back to gold, or should we have a paper money system? And um, there are many, many people at these kind of gatherings. Uh, and by the way, I'm on your side. Don't get me wrong. Um, who think there is something wicked about paper money? Look. We're not going to go back to gold. And gold is a primitive system. Um, moving gold around is expensive. It's not very safe. And uh, you've got to expensive to measure and to, and to weigh. And um, society has moved to, well, it didn't, wasn't society, but just individual kind of entrepreneurs and traders. And they discovered banking by accident um, about a 1,000 years ago probably curiously in Catalonia. Um, and I, my view, the key to it was actually the combination of Arabic numerals uh, and um, the, um, they were coming into, into uh, Western Europe and so on. Anyway, anyway, and since then, we've moved to a system which is 100% divorced from a commodity background um, and whatever one says about the mess we got to in the last three or four or five years, there was a period of um, about 15, 20 years um, when we had no commodity backing for our currency and still from the mid 80s through to five, four or five years ago, we had low inflation, stable economy, a lot of growth and so on. So we, mankind does not need a gold standard. But this thing will come, comes back time and time again. There's then related to this um, another subject, which is, um, um, isn't banking immoral? Um, and the way that a bank creates money, this may shock you, um, and um, is it simply creates a debt to its, uh, uh, just creates a debt and says we owe some cash, you know, this stuff, uh, to you, our customers, uh, and um, they then extend the loan or buy a security with the debt they've created. All right? There's nothing there. There's, nothing, there's no, no gold. There's no, actually, in fact, there's no pot of banknotes in the first place. There's a, there has to be some banknotes there. But, um, and so banking nowadays operates on what's called um, a cash reserve system in which cash is often um, around about, not so much nowadays, but um, in um, seven eight years ago, it was about one or two percent of banks' assets. And um, this fractional reserve banking um, was economizing on the use of cash and making the banks use it, all of the deposits and invested and so on. And um, may I just get, again, over to you straight away, that, um, in my opinion, fractional reserve banking is much superior to 100% reserve banking. Again, this comes back again because people say this is immoral and so on. Um, and so I, I strongly believe in a managed currency 
I believe that we should have a, a prosperous and successful banking system. And in my view, just to finish, because I haven't got very long, um, the, what's happened to, in a sense, I suppose, the West, I'm being a bit sort of, the West, the, 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 you know, the free market um, liberal democracies um, in, the last, in, in the last five, six years since the Great Recession began and it's now kind of, is there has been a kind of, in effect, a sort of, um, uh, what's the right word? Um, bankers are being regarded as wicked, okay? And um, they're being blamed for the recession that we've had, and this is in fact an attack on uh, the free market financial system. What the, the difference between capitalism and socialism, capitalism recognizes private property, respects private property rights, manages the um, conflicts through the rule of law, and let's be clear, you can buy and sell property, all right? You buy and sell property through a financial system. And the success of the financial system is very important to the success of a free society. And I find it very disappointing what's happened in the last two years, because in my view, the criticisms have come not only from the left, but also from the right, including these kind of fundamentalist conservatives, I, do not, I don't agree with them, that people want to go back to gold and 100% reserve banking, and I suspect that I know a lot of you. Anyway, there we are, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I'm like Tim, I'm going to prepare exactly what I want to say. Um, I don't want any event like this, I don't think we talk enough about financial freedom. Having been taxed on our income, surely we should then be free to use our money as we wish. But in the case of savers, interest from cash saving is taxed once again. Now, when they were opposition politicians, exactly five years ago, in fact, Osborne and Cameron attacked this double taxation. Uh, they promised to abolish it for base rate taxpayers. It never happened. That was just one promise they uh, completely abandoned. What did happen instead, of course, was 0.5% uh, base rate and QE conjuring up £375 billion pounds from thin air, the sort of thing that if you or I did, it's called counterfeiting. Uh, but when uh, the Bank of England does it, it's called quantitative easing. Now, Cameron and Osborne were on a, a sort of saver wooing binge five years ago. And Cameron said some, one of the few things I can agree with him on. Labour's recession policy increases debt and undermines savings. That's both economically stupid and morally indefensible. It's economically stupid because it keeps the debt crisis going, and it's morally indefensible because it punishes future generations and responsible savers in this generation for the irresponsibility of others. And yet, virtually nothing that has happened since then has, has uh, changed this. Still, we undermine savings. Still, we encourage people to take on more debt with schemes like funding for lending and help to buy. Yeah. Now, obviously, this is incredibly unfair to say this. Many people say that's just the price that's got to be paid, but for, for many savers, they've done without for many years in the hope that their savings can supplement their retirement income. Now, it's a very crude calculation, but to save our savers, we've simply taken what the interest rates were prevailing before um, bank rate was cut, and we reckon that savers since then have lost 117 billion pounds in interest for gone, while the capital has been eroded through this persistent inflation using RPI and another 209. So a total loss to savings of 326 billion pounds. Now, to use another example, taken on a personal level, I mean, if you had, for instance, a 100,000 pound mortgage, then essentially each year since you would be 3,200 pounds better off. If you're a saver with 100,000 pounds, which sort of sounds a lot, but it isn't really if you've been saving for a long time, then uh, you would have lost 4,200 pounds a year. So the borrower's gained 16,000 pounds, the saver has lost 21,000 pounds, a net transfer of 37,000 pounds. Now, while RPI has risen 19% in five years, an index of the essentials of life, that's the things that are most vital to those people who are retired and on a fixed income, things like food and energy, They've risen 33% in the same time. Now, those people who've got mortgages may well the less low interest rates, but McKinsey <laughs> have actually calculated that in the last five years, the net loss to UK households, that's over and above any gain from um, mortgages being lower, has been 66 billion pounds. And given that our economy is two thirds dependent upon consumer spending, that's a massive amount of lost consumption. 
The monetary policy of the last few years obviously had a dreadful effect upon pensions. Many companies have had to divert resources away from their core business to prop up pension deficits. Anyone retiring, turning a cash pot into an annuity, providing a fixed income for the rest of their life that cannot be changed, will find that a hundred thousand pound pot, which in 1990 would have given you about 15,000 pounds a year, is now giving about 5,000 pounds a year. And the last five years, that's almost halved. Now, you won't notice it, of course, if you're an MP, or if you work for the Bank of England, because they've got nice, handsome final salary pensions. Merlin King had a pension pot of five million pounds when he retired. But it is the reality of retirement for millions. Uh, and one of the main reasons, I can tell you, why over a million over 65s have remained in employment, and why one in five workers in the UK in a poll the other day said they now expect to work until at least 70. Now, several Bank of England high-ups and ex-MPC members have said that when they cut bank rates, to 0.5%. What they expected was that savers would go out and spend their savings. Now, that might be what economics textbooks suggest should happen, but of course the millions of people who actually make up the economy don't always act as the textbooks <laughs> suggest they will. Existing savers, of course, tended to husband their savings instead. Now, while the total of savings in the country, this is cash savings I'm talking about, has barely budged from 1.1 trillion, the actual household savings ratio, how much households generally of their income are saving, has declined. It's currently gone down to around 5%. And the Bank of England, in its latest inflation report, is hoping it's going to decline further to 3%, because, of course, they think that's going to boost consumer spending. Um, they even said that those people who don't have any savings will get further into debt in order to fuel that consumer spending, which, given that the UK household debt has currently hit a new record of 1.4 trillion, is rather worrying. Now, 20% of people in the UK apparently have no savings at all, it was only 7% two years ago. It's perhaps no surprise the whole ethos of savings is under threat. But given that the country's leading pension experts say you can't possibly hope to have an adequate pension unless 15% of your income is saved each year, what prospect do we have for future retirees in a country where the central bank wants to drive the savings ratio down from an inadequate 5% to a paltry 3%? The IEA just this week said that the UK's hidden indebtedness for pensions and old age care needs another 800 billion to be found over the next 60 years, equivalent to the tax take rising from 37% to 50. The state can't afford all its future obligations as it is. How is it going to cope with an increasingly impoverished retired population? Now, there's a widely held view that saving is somehow hoarding and that thrift harms an economy. But on the contrary, you can't hope to grow an economy long term by plundering savings and a short term hope of boosting consumer spending, you can only increase the wealth of a country by becoming more productive with the resources you have available. And that requires investment, and investment requires savings. And contrary to traditional Keynesian ideas with this paradox of thrift, savers don't abandon consumption when they save, they merely delay it, with their funds being used in the interim for investment to increase productivity and wealth. Now, it's no coincidence, I think, in the past five years we've seen just paltry investment levels. Um, but then, as every economist said to Ed Miliband when he said, oh, we're going to freeze energy prices, oh, you don't understand economics, Ed. When you artificially depress the price of something, you create a shortage. Well, I think this applies to money just as with anything else. It's prices depressed artificially by these nine theoretical economists. We, we don't have a central authority deciding Soviet style what the price of cars should be in this country. We would think it would be completely ludicrous, but somehow we allow it at the Bank of England, even when its economic forecasting record makes the Met Office look brilliant. <laughs> now, the greatest beneficiary from screwing over savers, of course, has been the government, the most indebted uh, group of all. Um, I do realise it wasn't a great time for George Osborne to become Chancellor, but he has borrowed more in the life of this Parliament than Labour did in 13 years. We've got government debt now around £1.2 trillion. Pounds. If you've been in the last uh, meeting with Martin Dirk, you'll have a vague idea of how much that is. We're still borrowing 110 billion a year. The last five years should have been a chance to get our house in order, but our banks, perhaps helped by aggressive lobbying against regulations, are probably no safer than they were. It's a year since Cyprus, when a proposed 6.7% confiscation of savings, met with worldwide condemnation, including in this country, from the same journalists who won't give savers the time of day. The Dutch finance, finance minister afterwards said that the Cyprus model is going to be used, this bail-in idea, is going to be used as a future model. And I'm sad to say there have been discussion papers from the Bank of England, from the Bundesbank, exploring this idea of the bail-ins, that basically if banks 
and sovereign states can't get their house in order, then the way they're going to do it is to steal other people's wealth. So to conclude, I think undermining savings, plundering pensions, and confiscating existing wealth is alarmingly short-sighted. Our essential seed corn's been gobbled up. It's like burning all the wood in a forest for warmth without any thought of replanting. So to go back, much as I hate quoting David Cameron, it is indeed economically stupid and morally indefensible, and I think it's almost certainly going to have appalling, if as yet unforeseen, consequences. I work in compliance in the city. There's a, a reputation of compliance of being some grey, crusty, dull area in the corner of the office, uh, wagging fingers at the trading floor. The fact is, regulations affect and affect the way we do financial business in this country, absolutely. Now, as Tim alluded to, financial services is uh, suffering from a reputational problem. There is a degree of hate among the population towards financial services, towards bankers, towards those people who earn very high salaries. Now, some of my clients are options brokers. Some of them are in their 20s and earning millions of pounds, and good for them. And HSBC very recently evaded, or announced they were going to evade the, um, avoid, um, the um, new remuneration rules from the EU, and I'm very, very glad to see it. But of course, what we're presented with in the press is a negative attitude towards this very clever and very reasonable and local domestic approach to rules that are coming from the EU. These are not domestic rules, they are coming from the EU. Now this twisted public sentiment against the city has legitimised the creep of the state, in particular the supranational state, that's the EU and beyond, in controlling our financial services and our financial environment. Mm. What's happened with LIBOR has been, it, it's heartbreaking. LIBOR has been very, very quietly dismantled. LIBOR was unique. It was an international and truly pan-global international interest rate setting model. And it's been very quietly dismantled. One by one, the LIBOR currency setting has been withdrawn. LIBOR has been, been acquired by the New York Stock Exchange Euronext. It is no longer owned by, the, by London, it's no longer owned by the UK, and our bankers have nothing to do with it. When you read about um, market manipulation, there were traders who were manipulating markets. That's already illegal. It has been illegal for a long time. Those people can be prosecuted, they can go to jail, they can suffer fines. But what's happened instead is the whole market has been vilified and LIBOR has been removed, and something that's really important, unique, key, so our position in the global financial services environment has been taken away. What's the saddest thing about that is that the people, our population, the people around us support it, have supported LIBOR with it being withdrawn, have supported the banks being castrated, have supported businessmen being removed from CEO positions and state um, CEOs being put in place instead. It's heartbreaking. So what's happening right now, underneath your noses, and this isn't playing to an audience, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in ropes. What's happening right now is a monumental shift away from directives to regulations. And it's happening very quietly, and you won't read about it, but the EU is requiring control of the city. The relationship no longer is between companies and the FCA or the PRA. The relationship is now just brand new regulations coming on the 1st of January this year. The relationship is between those companies, our companies, our city, and the ECB. The FCA, the PRA, they are there to communicate, to put people on the ground to do some supervision. But the FCA will tell you, we can't tell you what the rules are anymore. Your relationship, your firm's relationship is with the EBA. That's who you report to. They're the ones setting the rules. Now, this doesn't just encompass financial services. Quasi-financials are being brought into jurisdictions as well. So oil companies, um, even Sainsbury's, anybody who trades a derivative now has to report that der derivative trade, exchange with the OCC, has to report that trade to the EU. It doesn't matter who it is, it can be a non-financial, it can be a big charity, where the charity should be in a position to be 
um, <laughs> trading <laughs> derivatives is, is another matter, but still. There are situations, there's a Q&A on the EBA website, I'm a charity, do I have to report this derivative trade? Do I have to report the fact that I'm hedging my currencies? Yes, you do. You have to report it to the EU. There are supranational IDs coming in. This is not just within the EU, this is a relationship with the states. So there's something called the... Um, uh, it's, it's called a cheating. It's, it's in the Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange. That's where it started. And it's a legal entity identified and it's transnational. So it's beyond the EU. So this regulation is being harmonised globally. It's being taken not just away from us in terms of the EU, but away from us beyond the EU. Uh, there's so much material for those conspiracy theorists and people who worry about Bilderberg. There's so much material um, going on in financial services. It's uh, quite shocking. But, um, the future. We hear a lot about harmonisation. We hear a lot about the level playing field. And we've heard a lot about the city being under attack. We've heard a lot about from maybe the Express, maybe from the UK about the city is under threat. The EU don't care about taking business away from the city anymore. They may have tried. I, I, I don't really. I, I'm probably not in a position to speculate about what was going on ten years ago. So I was a, a pup then because I've been, I've been around in the city for a couple of years. But if they were ever trying to remove business from the city, it failed. They don't need to remove business from the city because they've acquired the city wholesale. It doesn't belong to us anymore. It doesn't belong to the UK. The UK cannot determine the nuances of something we are absolute international global specialist experts in. Nobody does financial services better than us. And yes, it's not us determining how we do financial services. Thank you. Before we start, um, I'm going to use my chairman's prerogative. Um, Simon, does your figure include all inflation or just unexpected inflation? It's just using the RPI. Okay, so the Fisher, the Fisher hypothesis is a, a concept in economics which says that, I think this might be a problem with your figure, because the Fisher hypothesis is a concept in economics which says that expected inflation is factored into nominal interest rates that savers get. So un only unexpected inflation hurts savers. If it's expected, the bank will pay them what they will basically compensate them for the loss. Um, so where savers have lost money over the last few years is because real interest rates have been, has been low. And that's a wider <coughs> rather than because um, inflation, expected yeah, inflation, yeah. Has, has been... So I said this I said very quickly, but then, then as I represent a savers organisation, I, I find it very odd that we actually have a system that wants to see 2% inflation. Every year. But if it's expected, then it shouldn't hurt savers. I mean, this is. A, a, I mean, Tim, I'm, I'm correct in stating this. Economists widely agree that expected inflation is factored into nominal interest rates. Correct? The Fisher hypothesis. <laughs> it's a bit more complicated. I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't think people want to have a, a, an economic spectrum when they say so. I, I, uh, it's a bit more complicated. Okay. <laughs> Can you elaborate at all? I'm quite. I'm quite interested because. I think, because I hear a lot that um, inflation every year is harming savers, but the impression that I've always been under, um, given the Fisher hypothesis, is that only unexpected inflation should be harmful to savers. I'm going to stand up. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, um, why have interest rates been so low uh, since uh, late 2008? Uh, they've been low because the banking system is being bashed around. The banking system, therefore, was under pressure to shrink. That would have caused the economy to go into a, an even worse recession than we had, and the Bank of England um, had to slash the overnight rate, which it controls. All right, you can have, by the way, in South America, some of us have the in the inflationary period, you sometimes have the short-term money market rate being 10%, but inflation was 50, and the, the central bank is the monopoly supplier of this kind of money, base money. So they can control the interest rate in that, regardless of, of, of Irving Fisher, could you be perfectly frank. Um, and can I come to sort of bring to Simon, really? Simon, bless you. Um, we are a nation. There are people who save through bank deposits, and then other people who borrow from banks. And so you can't say we as a nation are worse off 
because the depositors have received lower interest payments, because don't forget, the borrowers are better off because they've actually had to pay Which less Which is interest. why I quoted the McKinsey figure that says they believe UK households net are 66 billion worse off in the last few I years. couldn't care tongue towards McKinsey, you're talking rot. You can't, the two sides of a bank balance sheet are identical, all right? So they can't be worse off. The only way they can be worse off is if, in some sense, the banks have made a, a bigger turn out of customers. Look at banks' profit the last few years. Yes, but except for mortgages, most um, people who find borrowing from the bank or borrowing money on a credit card will find the rate is no cheaper than it was five years ago. Very little change. All right. Can I also just say one more thing before I shut up on, on this thing about QE? QE doesn't affect the very short-term rate. It does affect the bond yield. It, put, it puts the bond deal down by pushing the price of bonds up, all right? So all these people complaining about low bond yields, do they want the value of their savings to be reduced? The, the effect of pushing the bond yield down is to push the value of the bonds up. The effect of QE was a great surge in the, in the stock market. Do people want low share prices? <laughs> right, um, are there any questions? Okay, um, I'm going to take three questions at a time and hopefully in the order that the hands went up. So I'll go one, then two to the woman in the second row, and then three to the gentleman on the right. So um, um, I keep them short. Yes, I'll just address it to Tim. Um, first of all, I totally agree with you about gold. It's an interesting issue, but I don't think we do ourselves any favours by getting distracted into notions that we should go back to some sort of time in the 1850s where it's all based on gold. I agree with you about that. But I think where there is an issue, a wider issue, and the right's got a point, is the complaint is that the free market has not been applied in that banks, instead of being allowed to go bust like any other business would have been, they've been bailed out. And I appreciate that there are issues attached to that. Do you think there is a way in which we could have let the banks go bust commercially while still protecting maybe savers deposits or whatever it might be? Do you think that is a a realistic possibility. Thank you. Um, we'll take two more questions. Um, we'll in the second row. Right, I've uh, just downsized and I've got a very large sum of money to invest. Um, I, Lucky you. Having some money is a bit of a pain on the arse in some respects because if you've got something, the government's always after you to, to, to they, they just want it one way or the other. What I'm actually minded to do is put it into yet more property, um, which then means there's less property available for other people to buy. I don't care, my money will be relatively protected. But a lot of people are thinking like me in buying property, and this is creating knock-on problems elsewhere. And so I, I think it's incumbent on the government actually to do something to help people who do want to save up a nest egg for their old age and be protected, like I do. Obviously, old age is a long way away. <laughs> is there a question? No, well, what would you do with the money? Give it to the tax uh, <laughs> oh, uh, The third question from the gentleman on the right. Hi there. Um, just in release to the recent release of a Bitcoin anonymous online currency, uh, can you see a stable future for the Bitcoin currency? And thereafter, how far would you like Bitcoin regulated to stop the internet crime associated with it? Okay, so we have a question on bank bailouts, on investment, and on Bitcoin. Um, we'll start on the right and move left, on my right at least. Um, as to Bitcoin, I find, as somebody who's libertarian, I find it very interesting. I mean, I imagine it's everything in the outside government control until they find a way of controlling it. But I do find it very interesting to see there's another internationally usable means of exchange between people. I, I find it fascinating, but I don't really understand it well enough. <coughs> Bought a few myself just to try and understand it better. Um, what were the other two? Um, I'm not sure I was, what would you do? If what you would I do with my? <laughs> I really don't know. I'm afraid. I think part of the problem of artificially suppressing the, the price of money is that all, all sorts of unforeseen things happen. People are going into high-yielding speculative things that they really should not do, particularly if they're retired or about to retire. Um, you know, I can't, hand on heart, recommend that you go into cash savings because the rates are so appalling. But what are the alternatives? Um, you know, property has always been a good investment, but I, who knows if it's always going to be. Um, I, I might just add, I actually don't agree with the premise of your question. I think one of the chief arguments for Bitcoin and things like that is that you can conduct illegal activities with it. Um, as a libertarian, I think drugs should be legal. And I'm very pleased, well up until recently, that people could buy drugs peacefully and right. from people who were not selling drugs to children and were not selling drugs in street corners 
through sites like the Silk Road. And I think it's the regulation of websites like that is, that is a real tragedy. So I hope that something comes up to replace the Silk Road to allow people to buy drugs peacefully and efficiently online again. Well, the drugs are bad! bad. <laughs> well, thank you for that productive uh, addition to the conversation. Uh, Lucy, bank bailouts. Could we have avoided them? Can we avoid them in the future? Um, well, the, the increase recently of the NSCS's protection scheme over um, deposits and savings, it was increased to 85 grand per customer, per institution, uh, from, I, I can't remember what it was before, somewhere around 20. That was introduced by EU directive. Um, nobody obviously is aware of this, but when it's incongruously appeared on your, uh, in your financial pages, that's because everywhere else in the EU, they were also having 100,000 euros um, protected by their domestic um, protection schemes. That is in place now, so if banks do go under, 85 grand per uh, customer is protected by the government. Um, just briefly, to pick up a little bit on something Tim said, and, and, and you, uh, Madam, um, the, the lack of um, return on the stock market is partly because of the low rates that can be procured from bonds at the moment. The flight to investing in equities is something that has caused the stock market to rise and there is a lot of uh, speculation about that bubble at some point bursting. Of course, if interest rates go up, the stock market's going to come down. Um, it, it's, it's all very well uh, entrenched with each other in the eyes, stick with property or commodities if you're that way inclined with your risk uh, profile. Uh, as for Bitcoin regulation, uh, indeed Bitcoins are very um, well and uh, successfully used by criminals, money launderers, drug dealers, terrorists. Um, I also think they're fascinating and uh, any cryptocurrencies, I, I, I hope to see more of them, I hope to see that propagating, I have absolutely no doubt that if the uh, Federal Reserve could regulate them, then they already would be. Thank you. Tim. Well, I, I'm very worried about what I, you know, as we're giving an economic lecture, so I'll be very brief as points about uh, so-called um, bailouts. Society benefits from factual reserve banking because the bank's assets are being used uh, very effectively. And all, everything is being put into mortgages, loans, whatever. I think very low ratio of cash to total assets. But what that means is, every now and again, there's lack of confidence, people withdraw deposits, and the bank can't fund its assets. So the job of the central bank, this recognized job of the central bank, is to be available to help banks that have the solvent banks that have good assets uh, to make loans to them, so-called last resort loans. Now, this is not a subsidy to the banking industry. The loans must be at a penalty rate, all right? And the loans from the bank thing that were at a penalty rate, by the way, and um, so there's no subsidy there. And I just add also in parenthesis, the central bank could be privately owned and it could be capitalized by the banks themselves, which was in fact more or less the case in Britain until 1946. In practice, there was a problem in banking not in the capital. The banks sort of chipped in and helped. Lucy's just spoken about deposit insurance. Deposit insurance is sponsored by the state, as a result of legislation. The deposit insurance funds are built up by contributions from the banking industry. They are not a subsidy from the state. And can I also say, deposit insurance creates, talk about moral hazard, it deposit insurance is the cause of moral hazard. This yeah. is not a, a good thing at all from the point of making bankers behave sensibly in the long run. So much of, of the stuff you've read in the papers about this crisis was rubbish. And can I finish by saying that in America, the banking system of various interventions, okay. they're much more sensible, by the way, than we were here. Um, the American state is making a large profit from its interventions in the American banking system. The American banking system was never bust, and um, the, uh, the repayments of, of the loans were all completed, the equity investments have been repaid, and the, and the, the warrants have been canceled, and the, and the federal government's ending up with a nice profit. The only reason that's not happening here, is they make a profit on Lloyds and so on, is actually the investment in RBS. Uh, they're making they make profit out of Northern Rock and Bracken, Billy, by the way, 
that is actually a scandal, the amount of money they're making out of that. Um, but, but in his RBS, and um, there, in effect, the government, through its various changes, destroyed the RBS business model. I'm not saying RBS was well run, it wasn't, it was in uh, many ways catastrophic what was going on there. However, um, the, the idea that uh, what's happening, you know, that the, the bankers all to blame for this is not the case. And as Lucy says, it's leading to a lot of trouble in terms of basically, we're, we're basically giving up control of the bank industry to EU bureaucrats with no sympathy with it whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have time for two more questions, one minute each, please, at the very most. Very, very short questions. Martin at the back. Um, but Tim, Tim, you say that fractional reserve banking is it's really good for all of us, but isn't there a question of feeling here? But for those of us who don't think it's good, for those of us who don't want to operate the currency that the government is watering down, and the sterling's lost, what, 90% of its value since the early 70s, shouldn't we be free to operate in a different currency? I think one of the most uh, wonderful books I've ever read was Hayek's Denationalization of Money. This conference is about freedom. Surely we should be free not to operate okay. in sterling if we should, if I still wish. And one more question, uh, right at the back. Thank you. Um, is the apparent improvement in the economy the result of an Osbrown uh, credit boom to take us through the next election, or is it part of the economic cycle that would have happened anyway? Thank you. Um, I'm going to let each member of the panel speak for one minute and uh, sum up and answer the questions as well if they have time. Simon. Uh, well, I certainly agree with Martin. Um, as far as the apparent improvement in the economy, so Tim, Tim would know a great deal better than me. I suspect that it's very short term, that it might not. We might be lucky. Okay, we might simply have it. It might simply work, but I worry that it won't. I also worry considerably, it's something that one of our members brought to our attention, is that um, the measure of how well the economy done, real um, GDP, um, is adjusted for inflation. Um, I had not realized until very recently that for 50 years or so, the deflator that is applied to this uh, was roughly the same as RPR. And suddenly, over the last few years, the amount by which they've adjusted for inflation has changed to flatter the GDP figures to make them look much better. I've not been able to read anything on it. I suspect if I did read it, I probably wouldn't understand it. But I am rather worried that the figures have in some way over the past few years been fudged and made to look more attractive than they are. Thank you, Simon. Lizzie. There's no, there's no way of saying whether boom and bust will be happening with, without political interference. We are, the, the financial services industry is so thoroughly riddled with political interference. We, we don't know what it looks like without, without that, um, which, which really links to this fractional reserve question. Fractional reserve, oh, Tim, Tim talked about the 1 or 2%. There, there is an 8% rule that goes back to 1984. This was determined by the Basel Committee. That's an, International Committee of uh, Central Bankers and, and the head of, um, heads of um, uh, regulatory bodies. Um, it was determined back in the 1980s by that supranational body, that percentage, that fractional reserve. So for every £100 lent out, a bank has to hold £8. The, the population are treated, are, are, are treat, there, there's been a buy into this perpetual kittenhood, this perpetual childhood of the individual where the individual has, has, has become, is, is leaning so heavily on the state to intervene. It's become, um, self, it's become mutually perpetuating. Individual people have to, have to take responsibility for themselves and stop expecting the state and the regulators to absorb risk and think that because they've got money in the bag, it has to be safe. It can't possibly be any risk. The, this 8%, this fractional reserve, should be something that is completely free for um, institutions, should, uh, that the institutions can hold as much as they want and they should publish it for the consumers, so they know exactly the quality of the type of institution they're investing in. Yeah, yeah. But the, the individuals, the consumers, whether led by the, the press or, or just this, this uh, lean on the state, this perpetual childhood of not taking responsibility for ourselves and, and being happier with um, state intervention in our financial services. Um, Tim, one minute. Okay, can I, these are, I'm afraid these are very difficult topics. Uh, Lucy, the 8% um, ratio in Basel 1 uh, related to capital, not cash. Um, it was an item on the liability side of the balance sheet, not on the asset side. The asset side is cash, and again, confusingly, um, traditionally, if you go back 40 50 years, most of the official controls operated through cash ratios, not capital ratios. Bless you, I can talk about it later, it's quite complex. Um, <laughs> yes, Martin, your question is exactly the kind of question I expect from this or, or, audience. Um, I totally disagree with Hayek on denationalization of money. I wrote an article about it. I'm sorry, the, we are not going to get around a system in which we live in under the rule of law, there's going to be legislation and a government. 
we have in a society where there's going to be money, it's going to be, uh, it has to be, have some sort of genuine reliable value. You don't get rid of legal tender laws unless you go back to gold. And that's why I started off with these topics. We get these kind of debates going round and around at this kind of gathering time and time again, and we miss the really important things about what's going on today. And I'd like to say, Lucy, with you entirely, the distraction of this centre of excellence in our society, because the city of London was a great centre of excellence, and it's being, it is being destroyed as a disaster. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to all three of our panellists, and to you as well for coming. <laughs>